This is Revolution at Sea with John Curtis Perry. Episode 12, How Did England Become a Sea Power? There are reasons other than the potato or the Asian trade why the English would put the sea at the heart of their identity. Many had an awareness of how others had used the sea to their advantage, attacking and conquering Britain. The concerns of national security fused with economic opportunity, and the 16th century sees the unleashing of a new burst of English national energy with an accompanying sea-mindedness, a vigor personified by the ruling house, a consolidation of monarchical power occurred under the capable Tudors, two of the five being outstanding. Henry VIII is probably known today chiefly for having had six wives. He was a golden prince as we see him portrayed in his youth, handsome, athletic, and accomplished until his body became ravaged by overeating, excessive drinking, and syphilis. His daughter Elizabeth was a great figure of that or any age. The Tudors established fiscal efficiency, employing limited resources with great skill. The Protestant Reformation brought dissolution of the monasteries, centers of wealth, which provided huge amounts of capital, and the economy begins to produce more than society consumes. The buoyant attitudes of the Tudor era were evinced in the work of Richard Hakluyt, the greatest of Elizabethan publicists. He collected and disseminated geographical information, assembling explorers' reports and travelers' tales, informing and inspiring his readers. His principal navigations in three volumes, 1598 to 1600, comprised nearly two million words. They formed implicitly a gospel of empire, and Hakluyt's contemporary, Sir Walter Raleigh, was the greatest maritime propagandist of all. Raleigh left us frequently quoted words. Whoso commands the sea, commands the trade of the world. Whoso commands the trade of the world, commands the riches of the world. By the late 1500s, the chief arena and forum had become the Atlantic, and it forms the focal point for an oceanic empire the first of two British oceanic empires. China and Pacific Asia provided the initial impetus for this grand reach, reflecting the immense commercial lure of the world's richest state with its silks and porcelains, plus Southeast Asia and its spices. English Atlantic activity was initially characterized by voyages of search for Asia and discovery of something else. The Northmen, Vikings, the first Europeans known to have ventured across the Atlantic, by then were virtually unknown, their Atlantic crossings forgotten. The English ventured forth and found Aborigines on thinly populated American shores, where local people could offer little effective resistance, and many of whom would not last long because of their vulnerability to diseases, smallpox, measles, as well as the overwhelming impact of English firearms. America was initially a disappointment, Europeans wanted it not to exist. It seemed an unattractive landmass. Renaissance Europe had no population surplus. Attempts to circumvent Eurasia or North America led to a fruitless search for a far northern route to China, 
over either the top of Eurasia or the top of America, a northeast passage or a northwest passage. These searches over the next few centuries consume much energy with small result. A technology of wood and canvas simply did not permit sustained travel in ice-bound waters. And despite fervent hopes, the English found no mineral-rich dominions analogous to Mexico or Peru. But two other sources of wealth emerged. The first was Newfoundland fisheries. Fishery was a common industry for five maritime nations, England, France, the Netherlands, Portugal, and Spain. Fish were incredibly numerous. They said you could drop a bucket over a ship's side and pull it up full of cod. A second source of wealth was the Caribbean. It offered an ideal climate for the labor-intensive cultivation of tropical crops. The West Indies became the richest region in the Western Atlantic world, ideally suited for growing indigo, tobacco, and especially sugar. French Haiti was even richer than British Jamaica. As late as 1787, the exports of Haiti were more valuable than the total exports of the newly formed USA. Ironic, is it not, considering that Haiti today is the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere. But this wealth was harvested only at immense social cost. It was made possible only by a plantation economy based upon African slave labor, the result of a forced transatlantic diaspora of monumental proportions. Plantation agriculture spread to North America from Barbados for sugar north to Virginia for tobacco. But the English also trade increasingly in the Mediterranean as part of a general Atlantic intrusion into that world. And as the national wealth grew in the Tudor period, so did a home market for luxury goods such as wine, silk, spices, goods to be got from or via the Mediterranean. Alexandria serving as the great entrepot for Asian goods. In Pacific Asian waters, the English were unsuccessful. There, in China and Japan, they encountered unfriendly regimes, uninterested in trade, and Korea remained largely closed. The English fought European competitors especially the Dutch, who focused on Indonesian spices and shut England out of Japan. The English concentrated on South Asia and its handmade cotton textiles, ultimately supplying a much bigger market than Chinese silks and porcelains. In the early 17th century, Responding to the opportunities presented by a new awareness of the world ocean, England's strategic situation was one of weakness. The monarchy faced threats at home. Religious dissension tore at the fabric of the nation. With the unhappiness of English Catholics, a substantial minority denying the legitimacy of Queen Elizabeth, a broad threat also loomed in the form of vulnerability to invasion by the aggressive Philip II. Despite their vigorous personalities, Tudor infertility, a high incidence of sterility and stillbirths, brought dynastic uncertainties. Elizabeth never married. Her primary concern was her own survival. She was not an ideologue, but she passionately defended national interests as she perceived them. To remind you, 
The powers in the Atlantic world at that time in the late 16th century were Portugal fading fast, the Dutch Republic on a rapid rise, and Spain having reached its pinnacle of power with Philip II's campaign against heresy, putting severe strain on his financial resources. France was coming into importance. Unlike the tripartite Spanish Habsburgs, with territories in Iberia, Italy, and the Low Countries, France had the advantage of being a compact territorial state. With its huge population, great agricultural resources, and significant maritime economy, it threatened England and would become England's arch-rival. Despite their weakness on the European world scene, the English manifested extraordinary boldness and bravado, both in rhetoric and action. To Iberian attempts to close great tracts of oceanic space for the exclusive use of one nation, Elizabeth I retorted, The use of sea and the air is common to all. Neither can any title of the ocean belong to any people or private man. Hers was one of the first advocacies of the freedom of the sea. The English used sea power aggressively to damage Spain and to gain wealth. A large part of the navy comprised private vessels, commissioned raiders, government-authorized, licensed pirates. Piracy, in effect, becomes an arm of state power. Plunder from seaborne raids on Spanish treasure carried from the New World furnished England with significant financial support. It becomes the origin of English overseas investment, capital for forming the Levant Company, a forerunner of the English East India Company, analogous to the Dutch. Thus, a hybrid form of sea power emerged, a defensive royal battle fleet now maintained on a permanent basis plus an offensive predatory privateer fleet managed by privateersmen, sea dogs, who personify the ambitious and the aggressive. As non-state actors, they were free to do as they chose. The responsible queen had to be cautious, a masterly diplomat, an eloquent speaker. Elizabeth, was a learned woman. She read and conversed in several languages, haughty, vain, stingy, and greedy. Her suppleness of mind and wiliness of behavior make her another true Machiavellian prince. Unlike Philip II, she had no long-range policy simply her own survival in a highly uncertain political environment at home and abroad. But she brilliantly created an image of identity with the English nation. One of her favorites, because he fattened her purse, was Francis Drake, epitome of the privateersman. At best, we can describe him as rough-hewn, bold, intrepid, ingenious, eloquent, even the Spaniards, although his chief victims, admired the bravado of El Drago, as they called him. Drake was a man of little or no formal education, with strong Protestant prejudices. At sea, along with his sextant and charts, he carried with him his favorite book, a richly illustrated edition of Fox's Book of Martyrs, a Protestant polemic, recording in great detail the suffering and deaths of Protestants under Mary Tudor, Elizabeth's Roman Catholic predecessor on the throne. One of Drake's exploits was to sail into the harbor of Cadiz, 
to burn many Spanish ships at anchor there. He boasted that by doing so, he singed the beard of the king of Spain. Because of such exploits and the booty he brought to an impoverished and isolated England, and because of his ability to make people talk about him, Drake became a hero. He had a flair for PR, we would say, and he helped open an oceanic perspective to the English people. Drake was the first to sail an English ship across the Pacific and Indian Oceans and around the world from 1577 to 1580. Unlike Magellan, he survived with most of the ship's company alive and a spectacular haul, including many tons of New World silver bars captured from a Spanish treasure galleon. To haul it from Plymouth to London required an army of wagons. The return to his investors was 4,700%. The queen could clear England's national debt with three quarters of her share. Historians now see Drake as cruel and violent, an habitual liar, a thief, slave trader, and murderer, a skillful seaman but a poor commander. He played an insignificant role in engaging the 1588 Armada, that climactic battle in the channel between Spain and England, a victory that saved England from a dual attack. The Spanish armies under the Duke of Parma were waiting in the Low Countries to invade and subdue England with an army of 26,000 crack troops ready to be carried by flat-bottomed barges across the channel. They were there for a rendezvous to join 18,000 troops ferried from Spain aboard the ships of the Armada and together to stage the invasion. But first, the enterprise demanded command of the sea. The essential error became the failure to unite these two forces. And at sea, in protracted battle and stormy weather, Spain lost nearly one-half of its soldiers and sailors and more than one-third of its ships. The defeat of the Armada, 1588, becomes an important part of a national mythology glorifying English oceanic accomplishment, part of a new secular nationalism. The glamour of wealth that Drake and others brought in from their warlike expeditions on the ocean strongly affected the English national consciousness. New World silver added to Asian spices as enticement to oceanic adventure, and through privateering, Drake and other sea dogs, notably Hawkins and Frobisher, created the prototype of an ocean-going navy, a new type of blue-water strategic weapon for England, capable of striking hard blows thousands of miles from home, as long as fleets were small enough to be managed efficiently. Poor food preservation and a limited diet put health at risk and compromised success. The problem was the morale and endurance of the crew. A Spanish threat fades, reflecting an overextension of Spanish power. In 1598, Philip II dies without crushing the Protestants, either English or Dutch. And for the English, ideology wanes as a cause of enmity and war. Religion yields to commerce, Trade rivalries fester. Thus, the Protestant Netherlands becomes England's chief opponent on the global stage. But until the end of the 17th century, the English lacked the merchant fleet and the economic base to challenge the Dutch successfully. England faces rivals 
Nonetheless, despite its poverty and a hostile world, England does well as a sea power. How did this happen? Join us next time for episode 13, England Triumphs at Sea, to find out. Revolution at Sea is written and spoken by John Curtis Perry, with additional voicing by Jamie Rosenberg. Recording by 1623 Studios, Gloucester, Massachusetts. Production and distribution by Albert Buichade-Ferret. Goodbye until next time.